the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Last week, um, I began the first in a series of more detailed discussions of the religious answer to the problem of Jewish identity in our time. And you will recall I tried to discuss with you the position of the rationalists, those people who believe that it is somehow mentally possible to work out a series of ideas that explain what uh, seem to me to be the two major problems that confront us when we want to take the religious answer to the question of Jewish identity. And those two major questions are quite simple. I shall repeat them again until uh, I guess they're quite familiar to you. The first is the problem of religion altogether in modern times, the problem of whether there can be such a thing, whether it's possible to believe in God, and if so, what this kind of belief could mean to a modern man. But even if you answer the religious question, this doesn't give you an answer to Jewish identity. You must still explain what it means to be a Jew in religious terms, or perhaps even more important, not just what it means to be a Jew, but why it's worthwhile being a Jew. The Jew who finds himself in a non-Jewish surrounding, who is a member of a minority group, who is subject to certain disabilities, might be willing to be religious. But the question is, why should he be Jewishly religious? Why shouldn't he be religious in some other form of being religious, which would free him of the disabilities of being a Jew, and yet at the same time would give him the advantages of being a religious and an ethical and a decent human being. Now, the rationalist answer, as we saw, was an effort to explain that Judaism was in effect superior to other religious points of view. At any rate, it was certainly rationally different. And from the point of anyone who upheld the priority of, of ethics over thought, who believed in the importance of taking an active attitude toward history as against a passive one, it was the feeling of the rationalists, and particularly as exemplified by Leo Beck, that Judaism compared to other religions indicated a kind of superiority, at least to the Jew, which made it worth his while to be a Jew. <clears throat> now, having said that last week, and having defended the position as strongly as I could, I must begin this week by taking something of the opposite tack. The long essay by Leo Beck on Judaism and Christianity has recently been translated and made available in English uh, through the Jewish Publication Society. It's a long essay. It's an involved essay. Uh, it has all of Beck's familiar stylisms, the, the piling up of, of great formal structure, this compared to that, compared to this, compared to that, and it all works its way out at the end uh, to be uh, one great thing. But if one reads the essay, as I think you might enjoy doing, Leo Beck's Judaism and Christianity, one comes away with the feeling that this may be a certain kind of Christianity about which he is speaking, but it isn't the kind of Christianity which all Christians hold. The Christianity which Beck defeats in hand-to-hand -hand philosophic conduct and combat is a Christianity which may be Lutheran and may be German and might have been what was current in his time, but is by no means the kind of Christianity which one always meets on the American scene. One has a number of movements in America which are quite activist, which are quite positive, even though they start from a somewhat different theological basis. We've had another attempt in recent times to try to prove the superiority of Judaism by rational means. And this was a book by Abihillel Silver called Where Judaism Differed. Now in this book, Beck, uh, Silver has traced out a number of critical areas where Judaism has taken a somewhat different position from the religions uh, which Judaism has somehow bypassed in the course of its history, the religions to which it has not capitulated. And in every case, he leaves you with the impression, uh, if you have the same point of view that he does, a positive 
uh, active ethical one, but Judaism is really a superior religion. It's all very well and good if you believe in Judaism to begin with. But if you don't believe in Judaism to begin with, or, to put it differently, if you know something about the other religions and are not inclined to take them just at face value as he presents them, it's far more difficult to refute them. In short, the great problem with the rational defense of Judaism is that it's not quite clear that it's Christianity that they are defeating in, uh, in the discussion. It's not quite clear that they have done the same thing for Christianity that they have done for Judaism. In Judaism, they always take the best, the most positive, the most meaningful, and they ignore everything else. Their Judaism is always a selective Judaism. And the Christianity that they deal with is always a very selective Christianity, too. But not the kind of Christianity that one would have to select out of Christianity. I think, if I might state my own opinion, that the defeat comes too easy, that the proof of the value of Judaism is almost too cheap. It is far more interesting, rather, to have the great Jewish scholar let a great Christian scholar set up the understanding of what he thinks Christianity means. And as one reads some of the great Christian writers of our time, it's far more difficult, in my opinion, uh, to state the superiority of Judaism on strictly rational means. Now I want to carry that a step further. There are, after all, certain areas of the human existence and of human concern to which Christianity has paid more attention than Judaism. The question of sin, of anxiety, of not having the proper relationship with God. Now on these subjects, these subjective, internal, emotional almost subjects, Judaism has had very little to say. It's had very little to say because it's been mostly concerned with actions, which is all very well and good and all very delightful. But in our day, which is very self-conscious, very analytical, very concerned with what goes on in the human being, very often Christianity illuminates certain areas of human existence of which we are sometimes not quite conscious. Thus, it has been far easier for Christianity to appropriate the insights of psychiatry, particularly in the way in which we sin, in which we continually do the unrighteous act for reasons that we're not quite sure of, because they are unconscious, than it has been for Judaism. It's much easier for a Christian who starts out with the notion to begin with that man is going to get into difficulty and trouble, what he means by the doctrine of original sin. It's far more easy for Christianity to understand how a man is driven by hidden forces than for Judaism, which says the important thing is to do the commandments. Maybe I can't do the commandments. Maybe I am conflicted or confused. Maybe I have difficulties with my emotional relationships to my parents. Maybe I'm not sure. What is the relationship of my inner states to my outer acts? I'm not by this trying to convince you that uh, Judaism has nothing to say. But I am trying to indicate that precisely in the irrational aspects of being religious, Christianity has had a great deal to say that the rational proponents of Judaism have been unwilling to take account of. Or, to put it the other way around, by insisting that everything in Judaism was rational, they put themselves in the position that when the irrational bases of human behavior were clarified, were made, as a matter of fact, part of our common understanding of why most people behave the way they do. That a large part of the possible motivation for being what we are was taken away from them. By making everything rational, they had made themselves almost irrelevant to what drives most people to do the things they do. Judaism had been reduced to a thin veneer when really what was sustaining religiosity was something lying underneath. Now the rebellion against the rationalists, against the philosophers, against those who would reduce Judaism to a kind of a philosophical statement 
and God to an idea, which is a not quite a fair description of Beck, who was more than that, almost certainly. The reaction to these people began very shortly after Leo Beck wrote his famous book, The Essence of Judaism. We may trace the response to the rationalist position to begin with from a man named Franz Rosenzweig. And this evening, instead of spending all the time leading up to the man about whom I am going to speak, I am for a change going directly uh, into him. Uh, this is Franz Rosenzweig night. If you're accustomed to what I've been doing in the past, don't misunderstand that we're going on to somebody else. We're not going anyplace else. We're going to stay right here for the rest of the evening. Now, if one has to characterize Franz Rosenzweig, one has to give him a label. The only label by which, in modern times, one could apply to such a man uh, is an existentialist. Rosenzweig is an existentialist. He is a, not a Jean-Paul Sartre existentialist. He is not an atheist existentialist. He is a religious existentialist. There are a number of religious existentialists in our own time. Some of them are, the most, are among the most important religious thinkers. But existentialism in the Jewish world, which has only been a small and a not very significant current until just about now, is born with Franz Rosenzweig and comes on down to our own time later through Martin Buber, about whom I shall have more to say toward the end of the course. Now, the original question that arises with the rebellion against the rationalists is a question which I think needs to be asked once again. When the rationalists are done with their exposition, of what it means to be a Jew and of the superiority of Judaism. There are still some people who, after listening to the whole thing, would say, well, why not be a Christian anyway? <clears throat> you really haven't explained it to me, because there are things that Christianity has to offer that you don't take account of, and there are things in your explanation which doesn't deal with the best in Christianity, and besides which, in the last analysis, when one takes the very best of Christianity as against the very best of Judaism, it's very difficult to see that there's any major difference between them. Now, Rosenzweig took a position midway between the two alternatives which I pose here. He rejected both Christianity in a way which you will see was quite personal. And he also rejected the traditional rationalist explanations both of Judaism and why one should continue to be a Jew and evolved a third position of his own, a position which was neither a rational defense of Judaism nor Christianity. Now let's start with the story of Rosenzweig's life because it is not only a very dramatic one, but I think it makes clear how this point of view evolved and what it might mean to us. Rosenzweig was brought up in a rather decent, middle-class, liberal German-Jewish family. They were not distinguished for their religious observance or their religious interests. They were like many of the liberal Jews of Germany, people who paid absolutely no attention to being Jewish. And Rosenzweig grew up, as many boys did, getting the best advantages of schooling and university education and the opportunity to pursue a doctorate uh, and so on and so forth. He was a, an only child uh, and very close to his mother and uh, received the benefits that come uh, with being a single individual uh, in this way. He went uh, uh, on toward a doctorate and he toyed around with having a number of, uh, of different careers and he eventually wound up writing a doctoral dissertation on Hegel and the state. I am given to understand by people who have read it, although I have never read it myself, that it's a rather formidable document. It is a very fine first-class uh, academic analysis of a rather important problem uh, in Hegel, and Rosenzweig had indicated by this that he could have a fine academic career cut out for him. Now, mind you, this was a doctoral dissertation on the most rationalist of all the rationalist philosophers, Hegel, the man who had reduced everything, history and, and the movements in history and the conflicts in history, to the logical working out of one great principle, 
the absolute spirit which was working its way out and which was of course culminated in the state of Prussia. Thus the climax of the whole system was the state and particularly the state in which uh, Hegel had found himself in Berlin. And thus an analysis of Hegel and the state is as deep as one can get involved in an understanding of the most rationalist, intellectual, abstract kind of philosophy. With this growth in his university career came another growth, a growth toward Christianity. Rosenzweig uh, had a number of relatives who had converted to Christianity. You will recall, I believe, from a number of lectures back that one of the great alternatives toward Jewish identity, toward being a Jew in modern times, has been to become a Christian. And when we discussed Heinrich Heine and others like him, we pointed out that at one time this was one of the major alternatives for the Jew in our day. Well, it was still a considerable alternative in the time of Rosenzweig's youth before World War I. And particularly a cousin Rosenzweig had, with whom he was very close, Eugene Rosenstock Hussey, um, an elderly gentleman, I believe still either teaching at Princeton or um, uh, retired from teaching uh, at Princeton was a very close friend of the young Rosenzweigs, and they corresponded together, and they would meet each other once in a while. The young Eugene Rosenstock, you see, had converted to Christianity, and he sought to bring his influence to bear uh, upon uh, uh, his cousin to get the young Franz Rosenzweig to convert with him. Rosenzweig was definitely moving in this direction. There is no question about it. Two significant moments in his life may be mentioned in this connection because they were critical for everything that came upon him later. He tells the story, either in a letter or a diary, I don't recall at the moment, of a famous evening in which he was having a philosophical argument, I believe, with his cousin. And they stayed up all night discussing all night, not as the rabbis of B'nai Brak did in the Pesach Haggadah, discussing the plagues, but discussing the question of whether or not there was an absolute standard of morality in the universe. Is there really a right that's always right, no matter what you go, no matter what people say? Is there really a wrong that's always wrong? Or is it just the convenience of the society? It happens to work out conveniently that way, and here we do it this way, but there they do it that way, and you do whatever you have to do wherever you are. That's a critical argument a very important subject and still a very important one in our day. Does, for example, the question of payola differ depending upon how much you take? Or is the question of payola a question no matter of how much you take? This is in essence the same question. Rosenzweig was defending the relativist position. He tried to take the position, after all, the people in South Africa do it this way, and the people in the middle of South America do it this way, and there is a tribe in the South Pacific that does it that way, and the Germans think this, and the Americans think that, and how can you say there's a right and wrong? Same argument goes on to this day. But by the time the night was over, he had been driven, he reports, step by step, until he abandoned relativism. He was willing to admit that there is some kind of an absolute standard in the universe. Whether he could describe it or state it or put it into human language, by the time the evening was over, he could no longer return to this shilly shally. Now, if I had to interpret that moment in Rosenzweig's life, I would say that was the moment in Rosenzweig's life when the seeds of his personal religion were fixed, were sown, were placed there in the ground rather to bloom, uh, later to bloom and to flourish. From that moment on, Rosenzweig is going to be a religious man, but he's not yet a Jew. He might become a Christian. So he has the second problem. And now he moves toward the second problem, which is the problem of becoming a Christian. And it got to the point where his mother knew that this was going on, and while they weren't Jews, they didn't believe in anything, they didn't practice anything, nonetheless, while the other branches of the family might have people converting to Christianity, this was a little too much for Rosenzweig's mother, with whom he was very close. 
And finally, one day, shortly before Yom Kippur, Rosenzweig came downstairs and he and his mother had a conversation and she knew that he was getting ready to convert to Christianity. And she told him, in effect, that if he converted to Christianity, he might just as well leave the house and not come back. But this, of course, is not a rational argument, you will recall. And if Rosenzweig, being a philosopher at this time, knowing exactly where he stood, had nothing to do except to leave the house, and leave the house he did. And he went to Berlin. And then, shortly before going to become converted, for reasons which he never made clear, which no one can today explain, when Yom Kippur came, he did something he did not normally do. He went to services. And he went to the Yom Kippur service. It was the traditional service to which he went. There was nothing either particularly intelligible or aesthetic or inspiring or moving. It was just Yom Kippur. But when he came out at the conclusion of the Yom Kippur service, he knew he was a Jew. He knew he was a Jew in a personal sense. He knew he could never become a Christian, by which I meant he knew that there was something about him that he couldn't be a Christian. He didn't want to be a Christian, to put it in other words. Something of the Yom Kippur experience had explained to him not only that he was a Jew, but why he was a Jew and what it meant to be a Jew. Now at this point, the normal question is, well, what happened? And he never said a word about it from that point on, and never discussed it or hinted about it, as far as I know. And the only way that we can interpret it is in terms of the philosophy which he later wrote and the life which he lived. Now, the only other things that are important to note about Rosenzweig's life at this point is that shortly afterwards World War I began, Rosenzweig went into the army, he was sent to the Balkan front, and there on the Balkan front he was involved in a certain amount of uh, combat. Uh, sometimes months would go by in which it was relatively uh, uh, light, but there was life and there was death, and he saw death around him. And he had the opportunity to think because they weren't engaged in uh, uh, too many struggles. And one other thing happened. At one given point in the war, already in the little village in which he was stationed, he came in contact with East European Jews. That is to say, Jews who were still immersed in a traditional Judaism, still living a traditional Judaism. And the climax of this connection with the traditional Jews was a trip to Warsaw where he got to see masses of traditional Jews. He got a chance to see a Jewish community. Jews living as Jews in a community way. He'd never come across anything quite like this before, the living reality of what it meant to be a Jew under relatively Jewish auspices or circumstances. And both experiences had a profound effect upon him, the life and death and the fact of what it meant to be a living Jew. And while he was in the service, he would, on government postcards, write home to his mother a book on what it meant to be religious and what it meant to be a Jew and what a Jew thought it meant to be a Christian and what the relationship between the two of them was. His mother collected the postcards, and day by day she would transcribe what he had written and put it into the book form. When he came home from the war, the book was just about done. I don't know that he had really very much to do on it after he arrived home from the war, and it was published. It was published uh, under the title, The Star of Redemption. The Star of Redemption. I have never tried to read the Star of Redemption in German for the simple reason that my friends who were born in Germany and grew up in Germany have tried to read the Star of Redemption and tell me that it is fiendishly difficult to read and understand, both because of Rosenzweig's uh, German style 
and possibly also because of the fact that it was written in the way that it was, although there is apparently a plan which starts at the beginning and carries all the way through to the very end, as if the whole plan had been thought out but worked out in small detail. Most of our knowledge of Rosenzweig comes from a few little articles which are available in Hebrew, but mainly from a wonderful book in English called The Life and Thought of Franz Rosenzweig, edited by his close friend and disciple, Nahum Glatzer, G-L-A-T-Z-E-R. The book is particularly valuable because most of it consists of excerpts from Rosenzweig's letters. I'm not sure whether there was a journal or not. Uh, and writings, pamphlets, reviews, and the Star of Redemption. And there's largely from this English material, but I am going to expound now Rosenzweig's religious views for you. <laughs> thought. The life and thought of Franz Rosenzweig. Now, Rosenzweig doesn't think the way I am going to explain it to you, but I think it will be a little easier for you to understand if I explain it my way, and then you try to read Rosenzweig on his own although in the English he is not so terribly difficult to understand. In the first place, we have to understand Rosenzweig's general attitude toward religion. Now, what was the rationalist attitude toward religion? It was an attitude that said, if things are clear and logical and not contradictory, they're true. As long as one can make it an argument, an idea without flaw, that's what you believe in. No, said Rosenzweig, that's not what truth really is. Truth is something that has to be faced personally, that has to be grasped personally, that has to be appropriated. You've got to take it into yourself. All right, so something is true which hangs out in space. The idea of gravity is true, yes, it describes the relationship between things. But that doesn't, that's no real truth as far as a human being is it concerned. What's true for a human being is what moves him, what affects him, what he is willing to take a risk for, what he is willing to sacrifice himself for, what he is willing to give himself for. And the more he is willing to give to the idea the more true the idea is. And therefore, the greatest truth would be that truth for which everyone would be willing to give all their lives. Now, this is such a different way from the rationalist kind of thinking. I mean, the rationalist would say an idea can be true. Rosenzweig would say an idea is very interesting, but it doesn't affect my life. It might just as well not be true. It therefore isn't true. What's true is what gets me to live in a certain way, what gets me to act in a certain way. Particularly since most of the time when I start to act, I can't think out all the reasons for it. I can't be reasonable about every action, but life consists of action. Therefore, the truth which, which I hold, which I have come somehow to take into the very depths of my being, that's really what's true. Now, that being understood, instead of simply trying to think and philosophize about everything in the world around us, let's face the realities of what's in the world. Let's start with what you have to begin with in order to move around in the world at all. Now, in the first place, there's a world. You didn't ask for it. It's not logical that there should be a world. Nobody sat down and figured out whether there should be a world or shouldn't be a world. It's just there. The world is given to you, whether you like it or not. So you accept the world. But there is something else given, not just the world. There is man. Because man is a little different from the rest of the world. Man knows that the world is there. The world itself, whether it knows that it's there, whether it's conscious that it exists, that it has a being, probably not as best we can tell. But man is a little different. He not only is there, but he knows that he's there. Man is a different kind of creature from anything else in the world. 
So the minute you start thinking, you have to think about two things, man and the world. Now, at this point, you still might escape being religious by saying that's all. There's a world, it's stupid, it's irrational, it's unreasonable, and there's man who tries not to be stupid and tries not to be irrational. And you would wind up as an atheist existentialist. But Rosenzweig says, no, there is a third pole here. And this third pole is God. The absolute standard, the absolute, oh, what shall I say now? Plan, purpose, guide, maintainer, creator, upholder of the universe. There is God. The world is not senseless. The world is not meaningless. There is a God. Why does he say that there is a God? What are the proofs that he gives for the existence of God? You don't give proofs in this way of thinking. Because if you proved that there was a God there, all you would prove that there was an idea of God which was necessary. And to have an idea of God might not to believe, to believe in God at all. It's like being able to prove that God is there. You may know the cosmological proof and the teleological proof and the ontological proof. You know all the proofs, the so-called proofs. But you still don't believe in God. It's like knowing about the Muslim belief in God. It doesn't make you a Muslim. So from this point of view, don't try to prove that there is a God because proofs don't mean anything. What's important is to go out and face the universe, see what's there. And from Rosenzweig's point of view, the only way to explain the whole thing is to say there is a God. So he doesn't prove the existence of God, he simply says there is a God. Now these are the three poles of religion. Picture them in your mind as a giant triangle. God at the top, if you don't mind. The world and man at the bottom, if you don't mind. Now, says Rosenzweig, it's very interesting that if you take a look at that triangle, you will see that immediately there is a relationship existing between the various partners involved in that triangle. Let's take God and the world, for example. What is the relationship between God and the world? The world doesn't do anything for God. God does something for the world. What does he do? He creates it. God acts upon the world, creating it, bringing it into being, and keeping it there. Now, let's take the relationship between God and man. Again, man doesn't really do anything for God. But God does something for man. He lets man know who he is. He tells man about him. He reveals himself. So that from God to man, there is an action or a mode called revelation. God letting man know who he is and what he wants. And there is a third aspect of religion. It is the relationship between man and the world. The world can't do anything to man, really. That's no religion. But man can do something to the world. And what does he do? His job is to, to make it better, to perfect it, to carry it out to completion, to live in it in a righteous way, to bring the messianic age. And this we call redemption. This is the goal of religion. That in the creation, on the basis of the revelation, to act for redemption. And now if you do not mind, would you visually once again put these three points up. You have God at the top, and in the way that I am holding my hands to my side, here is the world. And then at the other base of the triangle is man. Now, between God and the world, we put a pole called creation. God, creation to the world. On the other side, we have God and man, and the pole between them is revelation. This is the action. And between man and the world, there is another pole. And that pole is redemption. And what do we have, strangely enough? We have two triangles, one on top of the other. We have the Star of David. The Star of David, which is the Star of Redemption. It is the star which explains and signifies the meaning of religion. Now, I hope I haven't made Rosenzweig sound to you like a, a silly person sitting around drawing pictures and diagrams and trying to fit religion 
uh, into some kind of a not so old Jewish symbol. Because that's not what he is at all. He is a man deeply concerned with what we find existing in the world and how we are to react to it. And what he says religion is, is quite simple. Religion is a consciousness of creation, that history begins so that it can go in a given direction. That, that direction is the redemption. That's what we're working toward. And we stand, we stand in the middle of a history, fortunately blessed by revelation, which was what gives us our guidance and tells us that there is creation, that there is a redemption, and how we should go about achieving it. That's what religion is. Now what does it mean to be a Jew? What does it mean to have Jewish identity in this understanding of religion? Well now in the first place, Rosenzweig makes a very important point when he says, everybody tries to explain Judaism in non-Jewish terms. Everybody has to begin by explaining Judaism either as Immanuel Kant would have understood it, or as Hegel would have understood it, uh, or in evolutionary terms. Why don't we stop that? Why don't we stop trying to be Jews in non-Jewish terms? Our real problem is to be ourselves, Jews, not to turn ourselves inside out trying to please somebody on the outside. What we need to do when we think of Judaism is to think in Jewish terms and to very carefully keep out the Christian way of thinking about religion from our environment that would uh, uh, change us from what we are. But the minute you say that, you recognize a certain fact about Jews, even thinking Jews in our day. Who are we, the Jews of today? If we were Jews who stood at the heart of being Jewish, if we were men of the nucleus, we wouldn't have these questions. We'd be Jews, we'd be believing, acting, living, breathing, thinking, eating, sleeping Jews. What's our problem? Our problem is that we all stand on the periphery of being Jewish. That's the trouble with most modern men today. They're not really Jews, they're, they're just about at the boundary line, they're almost not Jews. And the real problem of being Jewish in our time is to somehow make our way back from the extremes of Jewishness, from what is practically Christian, and somehow get back to being Jews again. It's only when we do that, only as we work our way back into the center, that we will really come to understand what it means to be a Jew. And therefore, for Rosenzweig, nothing was so important for the contemporary Jew as Jewish study, and particularly study of the classic sources of Judaism, the Bible and the rabbinic literature, and in Hebrew. Now we were doing all right until we got to the last part, because after all, that's what you're doing here. You're studying, you're, you're trying to somehow make your way either out of Judaism or perhaps into Judaism. But certainly this kind of study would be the kind of study that would lead a person closer and closer in toward what it might mean to be a Jew. But from Rosenzweig's point of view, the only way to really get to know what it means to be a Jew, finally, is to read the original sources in the original language. Then you're cut off even from the, the English words like religion or religious, which automatically have a Protestant flavor, which automatically take your thinking and tend to twist it uh, into non-Jewish patterns. Now, the final part about interested Rosenzweig was not just education, but Jewish action. Wasn't enough just to think about being a Jew, not enough just to philosophize about it, not enough to know the essence of Judaism. One had to actively live as a Jew, because that's what it means to be a Jew. To be a Jew down through the ages has meant somehow to act, to carry out one's life and activity in the course of history as a Jew would. Thus Rosenzweig is the man who tries to lead the movement from the margin back to the nucleus of Jewishness. He is the definer, in a way, of our status as Jewishly marginal men. Now, having said that, the question is, then what does it mean to be a Jew? 
Well, what does it mean to be a Jew? It means to ask the question, what does God say to the Jews? What is God's revelation to the Jews? What do the Jews understand from God that they ought to do in order to help redeem the world which God has created? And the answer to that is quite simple. The Jews are a group of people who in history made a covenant with God at Mount Sinai. The Jews are a group of people who had the historic experience of being told by God that he wanted them to live in a certain way so that through them all mankind might eventually come to know him, which to a Jew means to live in the way that he would want them to live. To be a Jew then is to be a man of the covenant. To be a person who belongs to a community of people that has a promise to God which was made at Mount Sinai and has been renewed through the generations, generation after generation after generation. That covenant continues down to the present day. That promise to God, that mutual acceptance of obligation on the part of Jews and on the part of God is still the motive power behind Jewish existence in our own day. Every Jew, whether he wishes to or not, stands under that covenant. He may not want to have anything to do with it. He may wish to ignore it. He may wish to reject it. But whether he likes it or not, the relationship between God and the people is there. And he may, if he wishes, not pay any attention to it. The covenant is there nonetheless. The covenant is twofold. The Jews are to live by God's law as best they can understand it. And God, in turn, will preserve and protect the Jewish people throughout their long history. Now, Rosenzweig says that the problem of being a Jew in our day is to come to recognize once again that this covenant is still in operation. It has never been rescinded. God still protects and cares for the Jewish people. Unfortunately, not every individual. But for the people as a whole, he cares and protects and guards and guides. That's what this people is doing here today. And maybe that's what Rosenzweig discovered in the synagogue on Yom Kippur. He discovered that God's covenant with Israel still exists when Jews will turn themselves to it. That God has not neglected the Jews and God has not deserted the Jews, but that God is there waiting patiently. As a matter of fact, he's more than waiting. He keeps gently bringing the Jews back to him. I don't know what happened to Rosenzweig in that synagogue, and I'm only giving a far-off guess, but his emphasis upon the reality of the covenant and the fact that every Jew stands under it would lead me to believe that this is what he had come to. Thus, what does it mean to be a Jew in our day? It means to share in that promise made by our fathers to God at Sinai, renewed again and again and again, it means to make that promise one's own. You don't have to do anything about it because it's yours to begin with. You're born into it, you recall. But to live under it. That's what it means to be a Jew. And why do we do it? Because it is a unique and extraordinary historical phenomenon. Never happened before the Jews. It will never happen again. It is, in a way, a key to all of human history that God should make himself known through our people. And therefore, we are willing to put up with all kinds of things in order to remain true to that promise, in order that through that promise, what religion says it's supposed to do will be done, namely, the redemption of the world will come about. Therefore, a Jew doesn't need to be a Christian to redeem the world. He is already redeeming the world by being a Jew. He has nothing to gain from becoming a Christian. Since the work of religion is redemption, the Jew carries out his redemption by being a Jew. Does Rosenzweig then reject Christianity? No. 
He comes up with what is one of the most extraordinary ideas in the entire spectrum of modern Jewish religious thought. He says, before we talk about Christianity, let's talk about Judaism for a moment. What is the way in which Jews live out their covenant? It's to create a certain kind of community. To keep that community together, to bind them tightly one toward the other. To let them be a community which is intense and qualitative in its attitudes. It doesn't have to be a very large community, and it's really not terribly concerned with numbers. What it's concerned with is having a nucleus. Now, says Rosenzweig, what about Christianity? What kind of a religion is Christianity? Is Christianity this kind of a religion? Oh, no, he says. Christianity is really a kind of opposite religion. Its interest is missions. It's going out to convert people. It's reaching out toward the world. It's, it's trying to bring people to know the great good news which the Christians possess. In a way, the Christians are really the people who are constantly at the edges, constantly <coughs> reaching forward to conquer new areas. Thus says Rosenzweig, and is Christianity false? No, says Rosenzweig. Christianity is not false. Then is Judaism false? No, says Rosenzweig. Neither is Judaism false. Maybe what we have, says Rosenzweig, is not a case of either or, but of both and. Maybe there is not just one true covenant in the universe, the covenant of Sinai. Maybe there are two. And they complement each other. The Jews maintain the interior, the nucleus, the heart of what it means to know God, and the Christians the exterior, the outward reaching form, that which brings this news to every part of the world. If I may put it into a phrase which I think is original with me, there is a great problem you see for each of these movements. Christianity spreads out so fast it may lose the content of its religion by compromising with the various groups that it comes in contact with. And there's a problem for the Jews. They may stay so close and small to, uh, and together that no one may ever hear of God. Therefore, in a way, the job of Judaism is to save God for the world. And the job of Christianity is to save the world for God. Each has its own role to play in the divine economy. Neither can exist without the other. Christianity is needed to finish off Judaism's job. Judaism is needed to make sure that Christianity doesn't become a false religion. According to Rosenzweig, there are two covenants, the covenant of Sinai and the covenant of Calvary. The two mountains, the two hills, each of which was a revelation of God to mankind. That's such a beautiful idea that I hate to tell you what he did with Islam. Because after all, one does have to ask the question, does one not? What about Islam? You must remember that the Muslims are stricter monotheists than the Christians by far. They won't allow anything, for example, but geometric drawings in their mosques, lest anyone think that God is either an animal or a human figure. Not even a lion of Judah upholding the Ten Commandments can get into a Muslim mosque. That's how strict they are in their monotheism. Now, what happens to them? Is there a third covenant? Is there another group? No, says Rosenzweig. Rosenzweig rejects the Muslims on the grounds that they don't really have a living religion. It's static. It has no sense of history. There is no moving, living relationship between God and the people through which there is some kind of active redemption going on. The Muslim, by accepting God's sovereignty to the extent that he does, doesn't allow himself the opportunity for progress or at least an effort to move forward that the Jew and the Christian does. 
And therefore, Rosenzweig considers Islam only a parody of the two great living religions, Judaism and Christianity, and dismisses it rather quickly. And that's disturbing. If a man living in a Protestant surrounding says that Judaism and Islam have the true covenants, we might be able to understand that. Maybe he's bitter against the people among whom he lives, so he insists that they don't have a real religion. But at least it indicates a breadth of understanding toward people among whom he doesn't live. But when he says that the people among whom I live, Jew and Christian, they both have the real religion, but nobody else does, then we have to be suspicious. I don't see how we can help ourselves. One wonders if Rosenzweig had grown up in Baghdad or Cairo, if he would have come to the same conclusion. As much as one may criticize the rationalists for not appreciating Christianity, so one has to wonder about Rosenzweig being able to appreciate uh, the Christians as much as he does. And secondly, there is a small technical problem with saying that Christianity has a genuine covenant. How does he know? How does he know that the Christian covenant is real? If truth is something that you accept personally, that you live by and you die by, he came close to being a Christian, but he never was. Therefore, how can he judge whether Christianity, by his own standards, is true? He never really was a Christian believer. He never really accepted the faith. He never lived under the covenant of Calvary. He can only surmise. It's a very brotherly, very loving thing to say. But one must ask certain questions about it. It is in some ways one of the most exciting and one of the most stimulating and also one of the most problematic parts of Rosenzweig's understanding of what it means to be a Jew and what it means to be a Christian. Now Rosenzweig spent the rest of his life living by this doctrine, namely that he stood under the covenant of Sinai and that the most important thing that could be done in his time was to help Jews move back from the edges of Judaism to the center of Judaism through study. And he became the director of what was to become a very famous German Jewish institution, the Yiddische Lehrhaus, the adult, what shall I call it, the adult school of the Frankfurt Jewish community. It was a school for adults which offered lectures on as serious and as intensive uh, a level as it was possible to do. Founded in the early 20s, it continued well into the 30s, and Rosenzweig was its director. And the theory which he propounded of bringing Jews back to the sources and to the sources in Hebrew, starting wherever they are, but bringing them back bit by bit, was the theory upon which the Lairhouse functioned. And it was one upon which Rosenzweig functioned. He not only learned Hebrew, but he became quite expert in his use of Hebrew. Later in his life, he even began to study Talmud and study Talmud daily so that he might master what was the great unknown classic uh, to most uh, German Jews, namely the core of Jewish traditional law. Rosenzweig's story might then have ended as the story of a man who had a great idea and lived by it and who wrote a, an enormously important philosophical work and one who started to bring German Jewry back to some conception of what it meant to be a Jew. But one day as Rosenzweig was getting on the streetcar, he stumbled. He found that he couldn't get his leg up to the streetcar step. He finally managed to get control of it, and he got up, but it bothered him. He took it to a doctor. And his doctor, who was a very close personal friend, soon diagnosed his case as one of, a, of an increasing paralysis. He was destined to become paralyzed. And over the course of the next few years, he became increasingly paralyzed. I believe his paralysis lasted a little over nine years, during the major part of which he lay in bed. Uh, after a while, he could, uh, you know, he could be sat up, but the only way he could be sat up was if his head was propped up with a kind of a hook which held it up. And for a long time, the only way in which he could communicate or write was by the use of one finger, I don't know which one, 
uh, and a special kind of a typewriter was rigged for him so that he could move his messages out. Finally, he could only communicate with his eyes and just mutter some things which his wife alone was able to understand and transcribe. Now, why do I tell you this? I tell you this because everything that he had had to say about religion was put to the test in this period. His attitude toward religion, that religion is to live, it is to be active, it is to be intelligent, it is to be Jewish, it is to stand under the covenant of Sinai and live on, was carried through completely. During the time that Rosenzweig was in bed with paralysis, he translated 50 poems of Yehuda HaLevi and published a commentary to them. He started a translation of the Bible into German with Martin Buber, which they carried through a considerable number of books before uh, his death. He did record reviews for one of the Frankfurt newspapers. Since he could no longer go out, his friends uh, came to his home and they held, had a synagogue there and they would pray there. And the, the life of this man who had no life at all except the barest kind of movement was an inspiration and a guide to everyone around him. To this day, people who knew Rosenzweig, who came into that household, who studied with this man who had none of the physical facilities that all of us take for granted, made the deepest and the most lasting impression. Rosenzweig then became more than what he would have been through the way in which he lived despite this illness, because this too was given. This too came from God's hand. And this too was responded to in the same way that a Jew responds to the world around him. In many ways, Rosenzweig is the symbol of the problem of the modern Jew, as well as of his cure. He is the prototype of all that we are, because he is right, we are all Baalei Teshuva. Literally, we are the men of the turning, the men of the return. We are the people who are turning our way back into Judaism. The phrase idiomatically means the repentant. Maybe that's also what we are. But his way, the way of study and the way of life, the way which refuses to give up under any circumstances, which knows where it stands and what it's going to live for, the way which is willing to take the risk, not just against the minor inconvenience of being barred from a social club or some small problem of a remark that someone may pay, but the one who is willing to believe despite the risk of having his whole life taken away from him, except the very last little bit of life itself. This is perhaps the way that we need to go to. The way of risk and of commitment and of devotion to who we are, despite what may happen to us. And now we have time for such questions as you would like to ask. Yes? Uh, would you say that um, Rosenzweig and Shulamash have the same theory about uh, Judaism and Christianity? Gee, it's a long time since I've read that little book, One Destiny, that uh, Sholem Ash wrote. Um, yes, Ash's uh, theory comes very close, although it's not nearly as uh, technical or deeply thought out. Ash sees a Christianity as a true and a legitimate religion, which is really taking Judaism and making what's true in Judaism known to mankind. Yes, I would say that in large part uh, there's a, a considerable... Uh, there's a considerable degree of similarity between them. Yes? Well, Dr. Rosenzweig and Dr. Barclays are very inspiring. <laughs> I'm a little confused about the Christianity aspect. Did he at no time take into account the persecution of the Jews by the Christians? Yes, he did. Well, there are always people who use religion for evil ends. I know, but the, but Judaism There's nothing in Christianity which teaches people to persecute Jews. I know, but Judaism, with Christianity, has been particularly bloody. 
Yes, it's true. The pagans really don't want to become Christians, do they? They convert and they say they're Christians, but they're really pagans underneath. The problem is to be a real Christian, you see. Just as the problem with Jews is to be a real Jew. No, I'm afraid you can't get out of the problem that way. Yes? Yes. They would never conceive of Judaism as complementing their activities. Well, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know whether Rosenzweig would care particularly whether Christians uh, accepted his point of view or not, although I imagine it would be helpful if they did. Uh, yes, it says go forth and convert the nations, um, but that indicates that they are centrifugal. When it says that salvation is of the Jews, I came not to destroy the law, but fulfill the law, one might very well get the impression that Christianity needs a Jewish base upon which to stand. No, I think you can cite equal evidence to indicate that uh, Christianity can be legitimately interpreted in this way. It would, however, be much nicer if it were a Christian thinker who said that there were two covenants, rather than a Jewish thinker, because Jewish thinkers are kind of always eager to raise Judaism to equal stature with Christianity. Uh, after all, as the junior partner in size, at least, we have certain status problems. It's only in rather recent times when a thinker with the uh, breadth of Reinhold Niebuhr will say that maybe it's about time that Christians gave up trying to convert Jews. Most of the Jews are doing about as well as most of the Christians are anyway, and in some respects are rather ahead. So why don't we just leave them alone and concentrate on somebody who needs the attention a little more? That's very rare, however, and it's been somewhat repudiated, although not entirely. It was a bold thing to say. <coughs> yes? Not beginning to convert? No. Excuse me? You mean it's been somewhat repudiated by Niebuhr himself? No, not by Niebuhr, by other Christians. Yes? Well, I was just wondering about the one that came back on me in the Rosenzweig thinking. It was a traditional Jew who lived against his thinking. Well, he's not, remember, Rosenzweig is not orthodox. If one had to find a spot for Rosenzweig in contemporary terms, one would have to say he's conservative. <coughs> well, of course, but don't you see, once one says that there is a possibility of development and change, this is where he's recommending a change. After all, what, what Jews ever brought forth a theory of Christianity before? I mean, where do you find in the Jewish tradition an analysis of the truth in Christianity? You don't. What you find in most of the traditional books is a rejection of arguments that Jesus is the Messiah. Now he says, come, come, we really ought to come to grips with the historical fact that there is a Christianity, that it does affect, people, affect people's lives. And what are we going to say about it? And then you see he makes a contribution to Jewish thinking. No, he is not a strict devotee of the past. He has something to add. Existentialism is a way of finding truth. It finds truth not in an objective, dispassionate, um, abstract, indifferent manner, and says the more indifferent you are to it, the more true it is. Of course, that shows you have no share in it. The existentialists say the opposite. No. Truth is to be found by what is personal. What you most deeply feel, that is most true. What you are most passionately affected by, that's really the truth. And while it may differ from person to person, you need to understand that truth then does differ from person to person. But that's the only sense in which there is real truth. It is truth to concrete, specific individuals. On the other hand, since most people are in pretty much the same situation, there is a certain kind of truth which each will find that will be the same, probably, as the kind that others find. I think the Uh, in other words, I walked into the park and said there were certain problems that uh, 
Niebuhr. Now Niebuhr has, uh, you might see Christianity as having a historical basis in the Old Testament, but to him there's certainly a qualitative difference between uh, conceiving how the Jews or how we conceive the God of the Old Testament as against the God of the New Testament. And I think the, in terms of the Christian Bible, the whole, the whole, the real Bible, in terms of Bible revelation, I think it's opened up a completely new experience as you're saying that the New Testament is an extension of the Old Testament because salvation, uh, I don't know, a few months ago, salvation is individual salvation based on faith. And this is pretty yeah, but that's but that's not quite relevant, if I may say so. I'll tell you why it's not quite. No, 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 no. Wait a minute. Let me let me see if I can explain why it's not quite relevant. It makes no difference whether Christianity is qualitatively different, whether it comes uh, as an outcome of Judaism or whether it's a radical break. We have to examine all those terms anyway. We don't have time to do it at the moment. The fact remains, says Rosenzweig, that both are true. And as far as he's concerned, they are both true. And, oh, but he would not say that. Excuse me, Islam is not true. It's not a living religion. And the religions of the Far East are not true religions because they don't have an ethical God. And as far as Rosenzweig is concerned, if they don't have an ethical God, they're not true religions. And since they don't have an ethical God, the Hindus don't have an ethical God, and the Buddhists have, uh, some of the Buddhist religions have a God, but he's indifferent to ethics. I mean, one may use ethics to get to him, but when you finally get to him, there are no ethics left. The Confucians don't have an ethical God because they don't have a God. And the Taoists don't have an ethical God. Therefore, as far as Judaism is concerned, from a Jewish point of view, they're not true religions. Because if God is anything, he is an ethical God. Now, the question is which religions are true? Now, it makes no difference upon what quality or upon what their structure is or what their philosophy is that Christianity may work in a certain way, and Judaism in another way, and the covenant is interpreted in this pattern, the covenant is interpreted there. Rosenzweig doesn't care. What he says is they are both true. Christianity is true for Christians. Judaism is true for Jews. And the way they work is that one supplements the other. Judaism does things for Christianity that Christianity cannot do on its own. And Christianity does something for Judaism that Judaism cannot do on its own. Well, that's what he says. That's his judgment. No. No. Sorry. You cannot be both a Christian and a Jew. No. You cannot be. A, in the first place, there is grave question as to whether a Quaker is a Christian. Does he accept, does he accept the Christ as his personal redeeming Savior? No. Social, socially has nothing to do with it. The Unitarians are not accepted among the Christians. At least they're not part of the National Council of Churches of Christ in America. And from most normal Christian points of view, they wouldn't be accepted. Of Unitarians and Universalists, we have 160,000 in the United States, and of Quakers less. So that we're talking about a quarter of a million people out of a Protestant population of 70 million. You can't take the most infinitesimal splinter and say that's Christianity. No, you have to define Christianity by its overwhelming groups who speak about the belief in the redeeming Christ, the Son of God. Now, if that's what it means to be a Christian, as it is for the overwhelming majority of Christians, if that's the covenant of Calvary, the very phrase covenant of Calvary, the Christ on the cross, the individual redeemed by, by believing in the Christ who was crucified and resurrected, a religion in which Easter is the key holiday, which it is not, neither to Quakers nor Unitarians, because the entire thing makes no sense to them. Easter is the, the key Christian holiday because it, it proves that the, the Christ is resurrected and therefore the Lord and the Savior. Now that's the covenant of Calvary, the resurrection, uh, the crucifixion and resurrection of the Christ. I preach Christ resurrected, uh, I preach Christ crucified and resurrected, says Paul. And that is the, that is the heart of the Christian. And Rosenzweig is willing to take it for that. He's not going to turn the Christians into something they won't recognize themselves as, and doesn't want to turn the Jews into something else. But he says they're both true. Now that's a tough idea, that you can have two religions which are true, which in part say, I don't understand how the other one can be true.
But if truth is not something that floats up in the air outside individual people, but something that people are willing to live and die by, that is personally appropriated sooner or later, then it's entirely possible that the, there may be two truths, and both may be true, and the only way we'll know is at the end of history. At the end of history, we will discover who has lived by what idea and been willing to take certain risks for it. Now, we Jews think that in the end of days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be exalted as the top of the mountains, and many nations shall flow unto it. And people shall come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go the Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. We think when the end of day comes, we'll be there. All right, says Rosenzweig, if we're there, we had the truth. And the Christian thinks that at the second coming, he'll be there. And the only way you can tell which one is really true is by seeing what people are willing to risk for this idea as history goes along. And for you, you start with what's true for you. You're a Jew. You stand if you're a Jew. You're a Jew. You stand under the covenant of Sinai. What does that covenant mean to you? What can it mean to you? That's where you start. That's where you begin. Before you go taking somebody else's covenant on, start with your own. That's the situation in which you find. So what do you have to reject one covenant in order to accept another? No, says Rosenzweig. Start with the covenant under which you stand. Accept it first and see what it means. What we need, unfortunately, therefore, is for each of us to have this kind of Yom Kippur experience, which I regret cannot be this evening. And if you will forgive me, I shall see you next Tuesday night. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.